The Lives of the Saints, by the Rev. Alban Butler, taken from the 4th edition, published in 1954. February 17th, St. Flavian, Martyr and Archbishop of Constantinople. St. Flavian was a priest of distinguished merit and treasurer of the Church of Constantinople when he succeeded St. Proclus in the Archbishopal dignity in 447. The eunuch Chrysophius, chamberlain to the emperor Theodosius the Younger, and a particular favorite, suggested to his master, a weak prince, to require of him a present out of gratitude to the emperor for his promotion. The holy bishop sent him some blessed bread, according to the custom of the church at that time, as a benediction and symbol of communion. Chrysophius let him know that it was a present of very different kind that it was expected from him. St. Flavian, an enemy of Simony, answered resolutely that the revenues and treasure of the church were designed for other uses, namely the honor of God and the relief of his poor. The eunuch, highly provoked at the bishop's refusal, from that moment resolved to contrive his ruin. Wherefore, with a view to his expulsion, he persuaded the emperor, by the means of his wife Eudoxia, to order the bishop to make Pulcheria, sister to Theodosius, a deaconess of his church. The saint's refusal was a second off offense in the eyes of the sycophants of the court. The next year, Chrysophius was still more grievously offended with our saint for his condemning the errors of his kinsman, Oitiches, abbot of a monastery of three hundred monks, near the city, who had acquired a reputation for virtue, but, in effect, was no better than an ignorant, proud, and obstinate man. His intemperate zeal against Nestorius for asserting two distinct persons in Christ threw him into the opposite error, that of denying two distinct natures after the Incarnation. In a council held by St. Flavian in 448, Eutychius was accused of this error by Eusebius of Deolorium, his former friend, and it was there condemned as heretical, and the author was cited to appear to give an account of his faith. On the day appointed in the last summons, he appeared before the council, but attended by two of the principal officers of the court and a troop of the imperial guards. Being admitted and interrogated on the point in question, that is, his faith concerning the Incarnation, he declared that he acknowledged indeed two natures before the Union, but after it only one. To all reasonings and authority produced against this tenet, his reply was that he did not come thither to dispute, but to satisfy the assembly what his faith was. The council, upon this, anathematized and deposed him, and St. Flavian pronounced the sentence which was subscribed by 32 bishops and 23 abbots, of which last 18 were priests. Eutoiches said privately to his guards that he appealed to the bishops of Rome, Egypt, and Jerusalem, and in a letter he wrote to St. Leo to complain of his usage in the council, he endeavored to impose to the Pope. But his holiness, being informed of the state of the affair by St. Flavian, wrote to him an ample declaration of the orthodox faith upon the point which was afterwards read and inserted in the Acts of the Council of Chalcedon, in which the errors of Eutyches were solemnly condemned. Chrysophius, however, had interest enough with the weak emperor to obtain an order for a re-examination of the cause between St. Flavian and Eutyches in another council. This met in April 449, consisting of about thirty bishops, one-third whereof had assisted at the late council. St. Flavian, being looked on as a party, Thalassius, bishop of Caesarea, presided in his room. After the strictest scrutiny into every particular, the impiety of Eutyches and the justice of our saints' proceedings clearly appeared. St. Flavian presented to the emperor a profession of his faith, wherein he condemned the errors of both Eutyches and Nestorius, his adversaries, pretending that he favored the latter. Chrysophius, though baffled in his attempts, was still bent on the ruin of the holy bishop, and employed all his craft and power to save Eutyches and destroy Flavian. With this view, he wrote to Discorus, a man of violent temper who had succeeded St. Cyril in the Patriarchal See of Alexandria, promising him his friendship and favor in all his designs if he would undertake the defense of the deposed abbot against Flavian and Eusebius. The Ascorus came into the, his measures and, by their joint interest with the Empress Eudoxia, glad of an opportunity to mortify Pulcheria, who had a high esteem for our saint, they prevailed with the emperor to order a council to be called at Ephesus to determine the dispute. Dioscorus was invited by the emperor to come and preside in it, accompanied with ten metropolitans and other bishops, together with the Archimandrite, or abbot Barsumus, a man strongly attached to Eutyches and Dioscorus. The like directions were sent to the other patriarchs. St. Leo, who was invited, though late, sent legates to act in his name, Julius, bishop of Putolia, Renatus, a priest who died on the road, Hilarius, a deacon, and Ocitius, a notary. 
he sent by them a learned letter to St. Flavian in which he taxes the ignorance of Eutyches in the Holy Scriptures and explains the Catholic doctrine against that heresiarch, which he also did by other letters. The false council of Ephesus for the violences therein used commonly called La Trotsinali was opened on the 8th of August in 449 and consisted of 130 bishops, or their deputies, from Egypt and the East. Eutyches was there and two officers from the emperor with a great number of soldiers. Everything was carried on by violence in open faction in favor of Eutyches by those officers and bishops who had espoused his party and formed a cabal. The Pope's legates were never suffered to read his letters to the council. The final result of the proceedings was to pronounce sentence of deposition against St. Flavian and Eusebius. The Pope's legates protested against this sentence. Hilarius the deacon cried out aloud, Contra digitor, opposition is made which Latin word was inserted in the Greek acts of the synod. And Dioscorus no sooner began to read the sentence, but he was interrupted by several of the bishops, who, prostrating themselves before him, besought him in the most submissive terms to proceed no further in so unwarrantable an affair. Upon this he starts up and calls aloud for the imperial commissioners, Elpidius and Eulogius, who, without more ado, ordered the church doors to be set open, upon which Proclus, the proconsul of Asia, entered, surrounded with a band of soldiers, and followed by a confused multitude with chains, clubs, and swords. This struck such a terror into the whole assembly that when the bishops were required by Dioscorus and his creatures to subscribe, a few or none had the courage to withstand his threats. The Pope's legates accepted, who protested aloud against these violent proceedings, one of whom was imprisoned. The other, Hilarius, got off with much difficulty and came safe to Rome. St. Flavian, on hearing the sentence read by Dioscorus, appealed from him to the Holy See and delivered his acts of appeal in writing to the Pope's legates then present. This so provoked Dioscorus that together with Barsumas and others of their party, after throwing the Holy Bishop on the ground, they so kicked and bruised him that he died within a few days in 449, not at Ephesus, as some have said by mistake, but in his exile at Epipus, two days' journey from that city, situated near Sades in Lydia, as Marcellinus testifies in his chronicle. The council being over, Dioscorus, with two of his Egyptian bishops, had the insolence to excommunicate St. Leo, but violence and injustice did not triumph long, for the emperor's eyes being opened on his sister Pulcheria's return to court, whom the ambition of Chrysophius had found means to remove in the beginning of these disturbances, the eunuch was disgraced and soon after put to death, and the empress Eudoxia obliged to retire to Jerusalem. The next year the emperor died, as Chidrena says, penitent, and Pulcheria, ascending the throne in 450, ordered St. Flavian's body to be brought with great honor to Constantinople, and there magnificently interred among his predecessors in that see. St. Leo had, upon the first news of these proceedings, wrote to him to com comfort him, as also to Theodosius, Pulcheria, and the clergy of Constantinople in his defense. The general council of Chalcedon declared him a saint and a martyr, and paid great honors to his memory in 451. The same council honorably restored Eusebius of Dorylium to his see. Popularius, who had been St. Leo's legate at Ephesus, had so great a veneration for the saint that he caused the martyrdom to be represented in a mosaic work in the church which he built in honor of the Holy Cross. The wicked Dioscorus was condemned by the council of Chalcedon in 451 and died obstinate and impenitent in the Eutychian heresy and his other crimes in his banishment at Gangres in 454. It was the glory of St. Flavian to die a martyr of the mystery of the incarnation of the Son of God. This is the fundamental article of the Christian religion, and above all other mysteries, challenges our most profound homages and constant devotion. In it hath God displayed in the most incomprehensible manner the astonishing immensity of his power, mercy, wisdom, and love, the contemplation of which will be the sweet occupation of angels and saints to all eternity. The servants of God on earth find their greatest delight in meditating on this great mystery and in profound adoration in transports of love, honoring, praising, and glorifying their divine Savior, in studying to put on his spirit by the constant union in mind and heart or of their thoughts and affections with him. But as the incarnation is the mystery of the unfathomed humility of God to heal the wound of our pride, it is only by humility and the annihilation of creatures in our hearts that we can be disposed to contemplate our or honor it with fruit. The dreadful fall and impenitence of Eutyches, after he had renounced the world with a view to give himself to God, were owing to the fatal sin of a secret pride.